JC, are you ready? We're running. Good battery? Good microphone? Okay. All right. So the debate that we're going to have is obviously about whether the crucifixion happened. It's on me to present the evidence that the crucifixion of Jesus Christ occurred. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to show you the different layers of evidence that build up to lead to the conclusion that the crucifixion occurred. And the first layer of evidence is what the church calls the kerygma, which is the oral tradition of the church, which predates the scriptures, but that the scriptures are evidence to its existence. So I'm going to evidence the fact that the scriptures uh, teach it that a pre-existent kerygma. And the reason why that's important is because I would argue that all of the scriptures were written between um, 35, 40 AD and 70 AD. Now, I can be happy to go with 90 AD if some scholars want to argue that. Um, it's a separate debate whether it should be 90 or 70. Um, but I, I personally believe 70, but I'll just go with 90 uh, to save that not being a huge argument. But the kerygma predates all of that. And I want to show you it. So in Luke chapter 1, uh, verses, uh, reading from verse 1, inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished amongst us, just as they were handed down to us by those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. So Luke is saying that before he wrote his Gospel of Luke and his book of Acts, that there was a pre existent teaching that is known amongst the Christian community. So the Christian community had a pre-existent teaching and obviously that includes the idea of the crucifixion as we'll see when I come to my second layer of evidence because all of the Gospels and the Epistles talk about the crucifixion. Um, and in the Gospel of John it states this is the disciple who is testifying to these things and wrote these things and we know that his testimony is true. In other words, we know that what he is testifying is true because we believe what he's testifying about. In other words, they had belief before the Gospel of John. Um, if you look at uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 15, uh, yeah, if you just bear with me. In 1 Corinthians 15, it teaches, sorry, wind. Okay, now I make known to you, brethren, the gospel which I preach to you, which also you received, in which also you stand, by which also you are saved, if you hold fast. In other words, before the letter of Corinthians was written, the gospel had been preached to the Corinthians. So in other words, what I've demonstrated from these passages is that before we even get into an argument about what anything the New Testament says or means, there is a gospel that has been preached, a belief that has been preached, that when we demonstrate, and we will very easily demonstrate, that it teaches that Christ was crucified, that that belief predates any literature and that means that it predates 40 AD if it predates 40 AD that puts that kerygma that teaching of the church incredibly close to 33 AD the time of the events and thus that tradition is a reliable witness to the events that they speak of right. do you want me to hold it for you where's the all right tell, on your first word um, so in terms of the, can I do the mic? Yes. Thank you. So in, so in terms of the uh, first, like, um, you know, verse that you quoted from the uh, Gospel of Luke, which mentions that, you know, um, yeah, which, which basically mentions that we, uh, those were things that were passed from, uh, fr from the previous generations, that were eyewitnesses. The, the problem with this is that we do not know who those eyewitnesses are as in they are basically anonymous individuals who pass down a certain teaching. Um, and I've got no problem with actually believing that individuals from the very beginning um, believe that Jesus himself was crucified. This is actually authentically transmitted in, in our sources as well. So we have an authentic report 
uh, where Jesus himself mentions to his closest disciples that I'm, I'm going to be raised and protected, but uh, who, who, who in here wishes to basically uh, sacrifice himself for me and take my image? So one of the disciples stood up and said, I will do this. And then Jesus prophesied that uh, as soon as I uh, departure, you Christians will split into three groups. Uh, two in the hellfire and one who's basically who will be saved and those are the true followers of Simon Peter right so the thing is that I've got no problem with with you know with belief in the crucifixion being very early uh, but the problem is that those individuals are not trustworthy I mean we know we don't know who they are uh, why do I have to take their words for it and also the, 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 the verse that you quoted from Corinthians uh, which is the teachings of Paul. Paul wasn't an eyewitness, so he can, you know, he can claim as much as he wants. And, and you know, the Muslims have a huge problem with Paul, so he's not really um, some kind of an authority. So I don't know why he's being quoted. There's also some like interesting verses that I want to quote from the Bible, which really, in my opinion, support the Islamic narrative. Um, if I do that, so if we go to Psalm uh, 91, uh, chapter Psalm 91. Psalm 91, uh, verse 10, all the way to, uh, to 16. So no, no harm will overtake you, no disaster will come near your tent. So the verse here is very, very clear. So the, the verse here is, is being very, very clear about how uh, the Christ or uh, Jesus will be saved, right? Because it basically says that he will protect him and the angels will guard him for he will command his angels concerning you to guard you in all your ways, right? They will lift you up in their hands. This is this is like word for word in what God says about Jesus when He says, "Wama qataluhu, wama salabuhu, wa lakin shubbi halam." Indeed, they did not. They killed him not. They crucified him not. But this was made apparent to them, right? So, and and by the way, the very interesting thing about Psalm uh, um, chapter ninety-one, verse sixteen, is that it has the word the, the name the name of Jesus in it. Salvation, Yeshua, literally means Jesus, right? So it's got the name of Jesus in it, and it's prophesizing very clearly. That, um, that this is about you know, Jesus. And by the way, Augustine confirms that this is about Jesus, but then when he says about the, 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 when he talks about the protecting part, he says, no, this is about the church. It's about all Christians being protected, which is very, very you know, fun way of looking at it. And by the way, in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter four, verse five to seven, uh, Jesus, um, there's like a discussion, a, a, a discussion between Satan and, um, and Jesus. So Matthew four, uh, chapter 4 verse 5 to 7 Then the devil took him to the holy city and set him on the highest point of the temple and then Satan says to Jesus If you are the son of God he said throw yourself down for it is written he will command his angels concerning you and they will lift you up in their hands so, you, so that you will not strike your foot against a stone and Jesus answered him It is also written uh, do not put the Lord uh, your God to the test which means that Jesus himself affirmed that he will be, that he will, that he will be, that he will be protected We'll have to swap. Yeah. It's a bit, a bit difficult to yeah. do this because all your hands full. This is what. Only if you want to, but do you fancy being timekeep? Do you fancy keeping the time for us? Yeah, with a... yeah, yeah. yeah, four minutes, four minutes. Only if you want to, bro. Yeah, I don't want to start. Tell us when you're, when you're ready. Okay. Um, I'll, so tell us when you're ready and then start when I, I'll, I start my first word. Yeah. Thank you so much, by the way. And the mic thing does I'll, I'll, I'll just basically approach you, like so, so my voice can be heard. Enough. Yeah, if my, I've got a hand free. Yeah. Right, you ready? Yeah, let me know when you want to go. I'm getting well from my first word. So the the first thing that I want to mention is that you quoted Psalm 91, and then you evidenced the fact that the church doesn't interpret that as a messianic psalm, because you quoted the fact that Augustine interprets that as referring to the whole church. So in other words. As a Christian, I'm not bound to how, which psalms you think are messianic. As a Christian, I'm bound to which one the apostles think are messianic. And Psalm 91 is not one of those psalms. Incidentally, incidentally, um, if I remember correctly, that psalm is the one quoted at the temptation of Christ. Um, and it is the one that uh, Satan quotes. So it's ironic that you should quote the psalm that the devil himself quotes to the Messiah, casting doubt on the idea of the Messiah's mission. I find that ironic. I also find it interesting that 
you are basically arguing the position that Christ himself rejects. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 21 onwards, we read, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and be raised up on the third day. Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, God forbid it, Lord. This shall never happen to you. But Jesus turned to him and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are a stumbling block to me, for you are not setting your mind on God's interests, but man's. So in other words, so in other words, can I have a time check, please? Yeah. So in other words, what we've got is the fact that you are arguing the position of Satan and you're using the evidence that Satan made. The, the scriptures are very clear that the, the Satan is the father of lies. And you have stated that Allah was the one who created a deception that convinced people that a crucifixion did occur, which is why you said you're happy to accept that a crucifixion did occur of someone who looked like Jesus. That means that Allah deceived the people to believe Christ was crucified. And because of that deception, Christianity, with the resurrection, is born. The problem with your argument is that the death of Christ is not enough to secure the birth of Christianity. If Christ had just died, his earlier followers would not have preached a resurrection. But they did go to preach a resurrection, not of some stranger, but of Jesus Christ. And that obviously the resurrection assumes the identity of the one crucified. And the one identified in the resurrection is Christ himself. Can I see the clock? Blood fire. Um, so what, what, we've, what we've got here is that you're making the argument of Satan, appealing to the tactics of Satan, using the words of Satan. I advise you to, in good counsel, to be aware of the source of the deception, to be aware of where your arguments are coming from, and, and to recognize that Jesus Christ himself rejects your position and says that it is a satanic position, and that to argue that they were deceived at the beginning, what's the time? It's quite two seconds. That, 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 that they, to argue that they were deceived in the first generation accuses Allah of being a liar, and I agree, because Allah is Satan, he is a liar. Time, four minutes. Um, right. When he's got to four minutes. Um, so in terms of the deception, it's just that... Thank, thank you. Uh, in, in terms of the deception, a, a deception is, is defined as such that no one can essentially um, derive to the truth. I mentioned very clearly that Jesus left the key to truth, which was, you know, St. Peter, right, his, his successor. So if you truly followed him, you would have realized that, he was, that it wasn't him who was put on the cross. But the problem is that you don't. You, put, you follow Paul. You follow individuals who weren't even eyewitnesses. You follow writers of Gospels who are anonymous. You don't follow uh, St. Peter. And even the two letters, by the way, written, which are attributed to St. Peter, they are, by most biblical scholars, not, you know, believed to be by him. So you have got nothing from him, essentially. Uh, which is quite sad, you know, because I've, I've actually read the Bible when I was 15 when I did my RS studies. And then, you know, I was refreshing my memory about how Peter was, he actually did have three letters. But then when I was researching about whether, whether those letters are considered to be, um, whether those le letters are considered to be, um, you know, attributed to him correctly, they aren't. Um, but the thing is that when I quoted Psalm 91, 10 to 16, Augustine says that this is about the, the first part. Uh, is about Jesus, but later on, when it's talking about um, when it's talking about you know being protected and being lifted by the angels and so on, he's um, all right, Rob. Right. We'll do our own time. Yeah. Uh, no, I'll, I'll time okay. I'm just because you can hear the time. Yeah, but we need to see it, bro. We need to see it. Which is which is basically he acknowledges that the initial part of Psalm 91, but chap, uh, chap, Psalm, Psalm chapter 91, verse 10 is talking about uh, Jesus, but the later parts of the, of, of, the, uh, of the verses talk about the church and whole. But the thing is, when I quoted Matthew, 
uh, chapter 4, verse 5 to 7, um, it's true that Satan is the one who is speaking, but um, in your own commentaries, they, they mention that when Jesus says to him, it is also written, this statement here, it is also, is an affirmation from Jesus, whereby he affirms the saying of, Jesus, of Satan. Satan doesn't always say, speak falsehood. You know, it's not, it's not each and every single word that comes out of Satan is falsehood. Which is why in your commentaries, uh, it, it, it's, it's mentioned that when, when, when Jesus says, it is also written, he's affirming that, yes, I will, I will be indeed protected. Which, you know, goes in line with, um, you know, um, Islamic teachings. The point being is that when we rely on, um, on, on gospel writers, for example, right? So, I'll, I'll bring like an example here with, uh, with like contradictions within the gospels. Um, right. So for example, with in Mark and Matthew, and I've got evidence for them basically taking from each other. So if we go to Mark chapter 10, verse 17 to 18, um, you know, it's the, it's the story of the rich and the kingdom of God. As Jesus started on his way, a man ran up to him and fell on his knees before him. And he says, good teacher, he asked, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he says, why do you call me good? Jesus answered, no one is good except God alone. Right? Why do you call me good? So this is um, quite, you know, anti-Trinitarian beliefs. So when we go to Matthew chapter 19, verse 16 to 17, uh, Jesus basically says, um, 19, uh, 16 to 17, Jesus says, uh, just, just then a man came up to Jesus and asked teacher, what, what good thing must I do to get eternal life? And said, why do you ask me about what is good? Jesus replied, there's only one good who is good. He doesn't negate that he is good himself. So we see a clear contradiction uh, between, you know, Matthew and Mark, right? So in, in Mark, uh, he, uh, Jesus says, why do you call me good? Uh, and, in, um, and in Matthew, Jesus says, only one is good, right? So there's a clear change um, within the, uh, the scripture. And we also read that basically Matthew and Mark would take, would take you know, word for word, you know, copying from each other. Thank you. Tell me when you're ready. Okay, ready? go. Yep. So, firstly, let, let's just deal with the fact that, that um, let's just deal with the last point first. And the last point first was talking about what happens in the Gospel of Mark. The, present, the idea that Christ is making an anti-Trinitarian statement where he says, why do you call me good? no one is good except God alone. That's not an anti-Trinitarian statement. If the God is Trinity, God can still be good alone. There's nothing anti-Trinitarian there. And Jesus says, don't call me good. He says, why do you call me good? In other words, what he's invoking from the person is, why do you call me good? Do you recognize that I'm God? because you recognize that I'm good. Remember, the rich man knelt before him and said, good teacher. So the man had recognized that Jesus was good. Jesus was saying, because you recognize that I am good, do you recognize that I am God? Why do you call me good? So there is no contradiction. Also, I think Muslims should be very cautious about trying to argue from what we call telescoping in literature because the fact of the matter is that in the Quran there's the same story told over and over again in different places and in different places it's told differently with different words being put into the, ha the mouth of Allah, the mouth of Adam and the mouth of Eve and the mouth of Satan when it talks about them being kicked out of the Garden of Eden. And it's funny that you should mention that, that the gospel writers borrowed from one another because that story that you find in the Quran about Adam and Eve, about them having that dialogue with Allah and Satan is something that is found in the gospel of Adam and Eve, which is a pre-Islamic Gnostic text that the, the, the Quran has basically lifted a story from and inserted into the Quran, along with a number of other stories like the, the, the Gnostic Gospel infancy where it talks about Jesus Christ creating birds from clay and breathing into them life. That's a pre-Islamic story. The Quran has statements of Muhammad's critics saying to Muhammad, all you are doing are repeating the stories from the ancients. In other words, we've heard these stories before and we know where these stories come from. 
They come from the Gospel of Adam and Eve. They come from the Gnostic infancy gospel. They come from the Babylonian Talmud. And the Quran borrows those stories. They're not from Allah. Muhammad was copying them from others. But so if it's a problem for Matthew to borrow from Luke or Luke to borrow from Mark, then why isn't it a problem when the Quran borrows from other literature? Now, you also mentioned about in the Gospel of Matthew, um, where it talks about the temptation of Christ. When we go to the temptation in Luke, that Satan does speak true words. Yes, he does speak true words, but he speaks true words to deceive. That is the nature of Satan. So when Satan talks, quotes Psalm 91, which are inspired of the Holy Spirit and therefore are true words, he quotes them to deceive. And we've already acknowledged that the church doesn't use that passage to speak about the Messiah, so I don't know why you're going back to it. All you're doing is asserting that it should be about the Messiah, but no Christian, even St. Augustine, the one authority you're using, doesn't use it. Um, and I want to, in my next talk, to go on and to present more about the evidence for the crucifixion. So, um, in terms of copying, I mean, you'd actually have to substantiate some evidence that the Quran takes from those sources. I mean, you can make claims that um, you can you can make claims that the uh, that the Quran, you know, copies from those texts, but you actually have to have to, have, have to substantiate it with evidence. So, if we read in in Matthew chapter twenty-four, verses fifteen to, to sixteen, um, he basically says, "So when you." Uh, so, so when you see standing in the holy place the abomination that causes desolation spoken of through the prophet Daniel, let the reader understand. And you go to basically Mark 13, 14, it says the exact same thing, let the reader understand. So they're copying from, from one another, right? So my issue was when uh, the poor, uh, or, or that man, you know, the, this idea of the, of the rich man in the kingdom, when he comes to Jesus, Jesus says, why do you call me good? But then when we go to Matthew, he says there is only one good. There's a clear change here because the author in Matthew felt very uncomfortable with Jesus denying himself being good or good. Right? He says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. There's a very clear contradiction right, within, within the actual uh, uh, scripture. Moreover, your book is corrupted. Right? If we actually go to John chapter 8, an entire chapter, and they've actually been very kind enough to tell us that the earliest manuscripts and many other ancient witnesses, uh, witnesses do not have John chapter 8 and whatever. It's like this idea, you know, because we're Christians, they like to quote uh, Jesus being this all-merciful individual that he denied the stoning. He, he basically said that whomever uh, has, has not sinned, may he cast the first stone. This, this is not found in the earliest manuscripts, so you've added it in. So there's actually, you know, evidence and, and, and by your own attestment, by, by, by your own scholars' admission that this, those are additions. Even in, in Matthew 28, you know, uh, this, uh, the, the only Trinitarian part where Jesus says, go and baptize in the name of the, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, in Matthew 28. Uh, yeah, let me just find it. Yeah. Um, Matthew 28. Yeah, here yeah, in Matthew 28, chapter 19, he basically says, uh, now go and baptize in the name of the Holy... I mean, you, you obviously know, know the verse, right? Um, uh, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name uh, of the Father and the Son of the Holy Spirit. Uh, Eusebius is one of the church fathers, and you've probably had this point before. Eusebius, he never quotes it this way. He always quotes, go and baptize in, in my name, the name of Christ. Right? So you don't have this Trinitarian edition. I will, however, attest that there, are, that there are earlier church fathers who do quote the whole thing. But this shows that one of the main church fathers had an entirely different Bible. He didn't have, you know, uh, the, the Trinitarian uh, mode of baptizing in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, right? This did not exist in his uh, in his Bible. Um, and moreover, there is no evidence. There is no evidence that prior to the second century of this idea of even existing. Right? So you just you just made it up. So I'm just giving two clear examples of where you guys have clear corruptions in your book. So this is not a source where I can you know come and take uh, my religion from. I, I I do agree that Jesus is very clearly mentioned as being crucified in all four Gospels. That's, that's obviously, you can't deny that. You have, you have to be insane to do that. But the point being is that uh, the book cannot be trusted when I've clearly given two examples. In John 8, a total fabrication and potentially also Matthew 28, 19 also being a fabrication. 
right? Or at least church fathers having different copies of the Bible. Um, so those are major, major concerns, right? Even when Luke says, okay, those were the assessments that we, that we got from the previous generations. Who are those previous generations? Why are they in authority? Why do I have to believe in what they say? Again, this is very central to why Muslims have a, a deep problem with, um, with the claims made in the gospel. I'm done. Okay, ready? So I, I just want to point out that the debate is not about Christian theology. The debate is about whether the crucifixion happened. This is a historical debate. So the fact that my interlocutor has already admitted that he accepts that the crucifixion account uh, occurred in that there was a crucifixion occurred in history it ends the argument the argument has been won in less than a few rounds for the crucifixion so all of this obfuscating about talking about what does mark mean when he says that there is no one good but god is not relevant to the point now he said that isubius quotes Matthew 28 in a different way. Isubius is notorious for getting his quotations wrong. And the most likely explanation for it, and this is actually the best explanation, is that he was trying to quote from memory. Not that he was using a different Bible. But even if he was, all that that would mean is that he was using a bad Bible, not the idea the, 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 the message of scripture was somehow lost because there would be many other Bibles that would have baptized in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. And you also admitted that as well, that other church fathers earlier to Isubius had quoted Matthew 28 properly. So your own argument is refuted by your own research. If only you would be consistent in the way that you construct your argument. And the reality is, one of the reasons why I talked about the early kerygma is because your belief system is based on a false premise. Your belief system is based on the fact that my faith in the crucifixion and resurrection of Jesus is dependent upon the New Testament. The reason why I started with the kerygma and evidenced the existence of the kerygma from the scriptures was to demonstrate that the the message of Christ crucified and Christ resurrected predated the entirety of the New Testament. And that's actually the question that we're debating, not the question that you're trying to now shift the argument onto, which is about whether we can believe the New Testament. But let's just deal with his argument as is. The question is not whether we can trust that the, there was a crucifixion, he admits that there was. The question should be, can we trust a known liar? According to the science of hadiths, the Shia say that they do not trust Aisha because Aisha lied to Muhammad. And therefore, she is not a trustworthy person. A liar cannot be trusted. But according to the Shia, Allah convinced hundreds of people that Jesus Christ was crucified when he wasn't. And he didn't correct himself until all those people were dead. And he corrected himself 600 years later, which means that we know Allah is a known liar and therefore just as the Shia can't trust Aisha, no one should trust Allah because he is a liar. He convinced everyone that Christ was crucified. When in truth, according to his beliefs, Jesus Christ was not crucified. So don't talk to me about whether we can trust the Gospels. The question is, can we trust the deceiver that is Allah? Yeah. So, in terms of making the claim that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala deceived everyone, you'd have to make, you have to present evidence for that. There is zero evidence, Quranically or in hadith or anywhere, that God deceived everyone. I just quoted an authentic hadith where Jesus says that two thirds of you will perish because you will, you will lead to deceive others. 
but one third, the ones who actually follow Saint Peter, Simon, right, his successor, they will be upon truth. They will attain paradise. So there is no total deception of everyone. That you, you, you literally just made that up. That is nowhere to be found in uh, Islamic literature, right? And I told you that this deception means that if each and every single individual cannot possibly attain the truth. That is what deception is. Not if you have the key to attain the truth. And the key was Saint Peter. If you, if you followed him, you would have known. But you didn't, right? You followed Paul of Tarsus, the killer, the murderer, <laughs> right? Uh, anyways, so, um, you know, th and the reason is why I quoted these contradictions in Matthew and Mark with the, uh, with the, you know, the, the, the poor, sorry, the, the, the rich man in his kingdom where Jesus says that you have to sell everything to follow me and so on. It's because the, sus the, the subtle change is very clear, right? In Mark, which is the earliest um, uh, you know, gospel written according to some opinions, I know you believe it's Matthew, but as, as far as I heard from my teachers back in school, it was Mark that was the earliest gospel. He's very clear where he says, why do you call me good? Only God is good. Then Matthew comes along and says, no, 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 there is only one good. So here, Jesus doesn't directly what? Cancel out that you know, uh, statement where we can see this subtle change. <clears throat> the reason as to why I quoted John 8, this idea that Jesus said, whomever may cast the first stone, you know, um, may, um, uh, um, whomever has not sinned may cast the first stone. This does not exist in the earliest manuscript. Your own Bible affirms this, which shows that the Bible has been corrupted. Right? So how can I trust this source? And the reason why I quote Matthew 28 is because your own church fathers couldn't keep, you know, logs of what is the Bible and what isn't the Bible. Now Eusebius, you say that he quoted from memory. You have to prove to me that he was a bad quoting. Perhaps he had a bad Bible. There is no concrete evidence that shows to us that he was purely quoting from memory. He could very potentially have had a Bible where, where this verse wasn't there, right? It was different. And I do concede that earlier church fathers do have the full verse. I do accept that. But when a major church father, that, that, that's, like, that's like if Ahmad ibn Hanbal had a different Quran than al-Maliki, than, than you know, Malik ibn Anas. That would be insane. You'd, be, you'd run along and tell us, look, your own imams have different Qurans. I mean, can you not understand how, how, like, how incredible that, that point is? So your Bible is corrupted, we've proven that with John 8, and so it's not a source. Now, you mentioned that you know, earlier individuals, as, as proclaimed in the Gospel of Luke, this was passed down, so this supersedes or is earlier than the, uh, than, the, than the teachings of the Gospels. I do agree with that. I agree that there were people during the time of Jesus who were you know, hypocrites, who were the people of hellfire, who taught wrong teachings. So. What does that even mean, that earlier eyewitnesses? Why are they trustworthy? Why do I have to believe in what they're saying? You didn't address that point at all. So the reason as to why I've highlighted these contradictions and these problems in the Bible, right, is because that I can't take it as a source. And even those earlier generations are not any kind of authority. That's my main, main problem with the, with the claims made in the Bible. Okay, thank you. Are you ready? So just listen to what he said. He said that the only way it's a lie is if everyone is deceived and if they can't get to the truth. That's utter rubbish. If you lie to one person and tell the truth to 99 other people, you're a liar. Full stop. End of story. Allah lied. He admitted that Allah deceived people. So Allah is a liar according not to what I said, but to what he said. And the only way that he can get around it is to say Allah's only a liar if he deceives everybody. What utter rubbish. If you lie to a single person, you are a liar. And Allah didn't lie to one person. He lied to hundreds of people, thousands of people, tens of thousands of people. Why? Because Christians, between the year, between the first century and the seventh century, taught that Christ was crucified. If we accept that that belief emerged from an action of Allah, then that means Allah allowed a lie to prosper, a lie that he started. So Allah is a liar. Why should we trust a liar? I notice he didn't answer that question. Eusebius's Bible is irrelevant to the topic we're talking about, was Jesus Christ crucified? I've demonstrated the kerygma. Now let me go on to the second point of evidence. The New Testament is a first century Jewish document. You don't even have to believe in it to treat it like history. No historian 
No historian would dismiss the New Testament as evidence about the crucifixion because of arguments about maybe it was corrupted about issues around baptism. And the unanimous agreement of all four Gospels and the vast majority of the epistles is that Christ was crucified. Which means that not only do we have evidence of an early oral tradition that predates the writing of the New Testament, we also have historical documents from the first century that demonstrate Christ was crucified. I'm only going to quote one verse. And in Mark 5, I'm going to quote Mark chapter 15, reading from verse 22. Then they brought him to a place called Golgotha, which is translated as place as a skull. They tried to give him wine and mixed myrrh, but he did not take it, and they crucified him. And that is a refrain that is repeated in the Gospel of Matthew, the Gospel of Luke, the Gospel of John, and the writings of Paul in his epistles. In other words, even if we say that these are anonymous documents, and even if we say that some of the documents have been corrupted on this point or that point, there is universality, uniformity about the fact that Christ was crucified. You don't need to be a Christian to be a historian, but to be a historian means you go where the evidence leads you. And the evidence is that there is an early oral tradition that predates the New Testament that talks about Christ crucified, and we have a first century series of documents written by multiple people in multiple places independently of one another that all say Christ was crucified. And what is my Shia interlocutor's best defense? Allah lied. Allah made it appear that way. Allah deceived people. If Allah lied to one person, he is a liar. And he did. And he didn't correct himself for 700 years. How can you trust a liar? Right. Um, in terms of, in terms of the arguments that I've presented, I've been very clear in terms of like what what deception is supposed to mean. If you if you have the key to knowing the truth, and Jesus and Jesus has. And uh, Jesus has clarified what the truth is and where to get the truth through St. Peter, which you have not done, right? The only two letters which you have from him, from St. Peter are doubted by m the majority of biblical scholars. So you have nothing from him, right? Those were, those were not written by St. Peter. So you have nothing from this individual who Jesus told you to follow, who Jesus said that he will be the, the rock uh, up upon whom where the church will be built, right? So. When you, when, you, when you haven't followed the individual who Jesus told you to follow, of course you're going to follow unknown individuals who make all sorts of claims. And notice how he started ex exaggerating the, 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 the numbers exponentially. Hundreds of people, thousands of people, tens of thousands. Where, where are you getting these numbers from? Right? Calm down, mate. You have to substantiate your claims with evidence. Making claims openly and just saying that, you know, just bringing out numbers but with all due respect from your behind where, you, where, where you've got no source to point towards, it's just empty talk, you know. I can, I, can, I can make all sorts of claims. Prove to me that tens of thousands of people, you know, attested to Jesus being crucified. Even in your own gospel, the, the only four witnesses were, there's four, there's four witnesses to it. Where, where'd you get tens of thousands of people? Jesus Christ, I literally, <laughs> right? So, so. There's no need to the, blaspheme. That's not blasphemy. Jesus Christ is, uh, is my prophet. I, I, I can say his name. Why, why is that blasphemy? So, anyways, um, the, the point being is um, we've got issues with those claims, right? And by the way, even the non-gospel accounts, so even if you want to use some Roman accounts and um, some other individuals that attest that Jesus did crucify, they all came after him, right? So a lie can spread. But I, I, just, to I just told you that deception cannot, cannot occur when you actually leave the key to truth, right? Because Jesus, Jesus ha had to have been protected, as I quoted from Psalm. This is how we understand uh, the events, right? So this goes in line with Quranic uh, beliefs that Jesus will be protected and for him to be protected someone took uh, the sacrifice. Now Jesus did leave the key uh, of truth of finding the, the, the reality which is through St. Peter. Right? But, um, but the issue is that you didn't follow him. So 
the main problem is that you don't have any substantial evidence. Now, from a, by the way, from a historical perspective, obviously, if we were to use Occam's razor, obviously Jesus was crucified. <laughs> I don't contest to that. But I'm just saying that through the Islamic you know, paradigm, it's not impossible. Is it probable? Is it not probable? That's an entire discussion. But about impossibility, no, it's not impossible. But, but using Occam's razor, the most simple explanation is that the man who looked exactly like Jesus was crucified was probably Jesus, right? That's, that, that makes sense. I'm not contesting that. I'm not saying that the Gospels don't quote that Jesus was crucified. I, I do agree. But I'm just saying that one cannot detest and cancel the Islamic claims purely based on individuals whom were not made an authority by Jesus himself, right? I don't care about those individuals mentioned in the Gospel of Luke who passed down that tradition. Who are those individuals? You still didn't answer that because you know what? You will never be able to answer that. They are completely unknown. We have a tradition where each and every single person who narrates to us is completely known. You do not, right? So those individuals who narrate to you that Jesus was crucified, are they on authority? You know, objectively speaking, as both, both of us, we both claim to be followers of Christ. I claim to be a follower of Christ. You claim to be a follower of Christ. So you need to prove to me that those are, um, you know, just individuals based on the principles of Christ. You can never do that. We good? So once again, the brother has, has admitted that the only logical conclusion to draw from all the evidence is that Christ was crucified. And I need to remind him again, the debate that we're having is whether Jesus Christ was crucified. That's the debate we're having. So all of these other red herrings that he's throwing up from this point forward, I'm just going to ignore because they're actually irrelevant. Now he talks about the fact that we don't know who wrote the gospel. It's irrelevant to whether the gospels are a first century document that testify to Christ's crucifixion, which they do, as do the epistles in the New Testament. It's irrelevant to whether those texts have been maintained 100% purity because there's no biblical scholar that would stand in front of an audience and put his academic career on the line by saying that the Gospels are a first century document that do not testify to the crucifixion. So his arguments are actually irrelevant. We're talking about whether Christ was crucified and to make that decision, you have to look for evidence. And I'm providing evidence. All my interlocutor is doing is throwing up red herrings, obfuscations, and actual admissions that his God is a liar, liar, pants on fire. He literally lied. And yet Muslims use lying as a reason to reject the hadiths of Aisha but not reject the claims of Allah, despite the fact that he's being a liar. I'd like to add now a third layer of evidence that Christ was crucified. The first layer of evidence is the kerygma, the oral tradition, as we've demonstrated. The second layer of evidence is the New Testament, a first century Jewish document that testifies that Christ was crucified. Third, layer of evidence, writings of the early church fathers. And I'm going to quote Ignatius, who was writing in the early 100s. So he is an early church father, close to the time, and what does he say? He says things like this, unless we are ready and willing to die in conformity with his passion, his life is not in us. He goes on to say this, thanks to him and his death, that death, though some deny it, is the very mystery which has moved us to become believers and endure tribulation to prove ourselves pupils of Jesus Christ, our sole teacher. He goes on to say this, I want you to be unshakenly convinced of the birth, the passion and the resurrection which were the true and indisputable experiences of Jesus Christ. So in early antiquity, it was an established fact, an understood fact, that Christ was crucified. 
So who were the people that he refers are the ones that deny it? They were the Docetists, people who said Christ wasn't crucified because he was God and God was not crucified. In other words, they deny the crucifixion because they believe Christ had true divinity but not true humanity. They accepted that there was an appearance of crucifixion of the person of Jesus Christ. In terms of addressing the point about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala being a liar, if we were to define the word liar, how, how are we going to understand what a liar is? A liar is obviously an individual who makes a claim and the claim is untrue. It is the opposite of what the person claims. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not claim that that man whom he changed to look like Jesus was Jesus. Where did, he, where did Allah claim that? So you're making points which are in reality not substantiated by any evidence. You call Allah a deceiver and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala leaves a key to discovering the truth. And he does not even call that, that person whom he made to look like Jesus, Jesus. He didn't, like there was no call from the heavens, you know, oh people here, this person who I've changed, uh, you know, from, uh, to look like Jesus is Jesus. This, this doesn't happen. Jesus, uh, God did this to protect his messenger. That's all. And by the way, we the Shia believe that Jesus was actually uh, hung. He, he just wasn't crucified. So he wasn't totally, you know, un unscathed. He, he was hung, but the crucifixion never occurred in, in according to Shia uh, theology. Now he quoted Ignatius. Second century, Jesus supposedly crucified year 33. Uh, you can eat that and keep it for yourself, yeah? I don't, I don't care what Ignatius says. Ignatius was from the second century. That's a way later individual. Okay, you can, if you, if you want to trust Ignatius over Peter, and by the way, you, you still haven't addressed this. Jesus says in your own gospels, oh Peter, you, you, you shall be my, the boulder upon which my church is to be built, right? So what, what are the teachings of Peter? Why are they all gone? Why are they all swallowed up? We're actually talking about the crucifixion of Christ. You're right about that. We're not talking about a historical analysis. We are people of faith. Therefore, we see that Jesus has a certain type of authority. Okay? Therefore, you need to prove to me objectively that those individuals who narrate X, Y, Z are narrating on behalf of him, on behalf of his authority, right? On behalf of what he's saying. So, this is not a historical discussion solely. I, I do concede that there is obviously, we're discussing history here but it's also on a faith-based historical narrative which means that you need to objectively prove to me that Jesus himself um, is making certain types of authority after him and those individuals, their testimony means something right, so when you tell me, I don't care if they're anonymous, I don't care if we don't know them well then you're relying upon individuals whom you do not know you're relying upon your salvation, upon individuals whom you've got no idea about it makes zero sense, literally, okay from a historical perspective, I told you, no historian is going to tell you that Jesus wasn't crucified. We've got no issue with that. That's not, that's not the issue at hand. We're people of faith. We're, dis we're discussing Jesus himself, whom we both believe in, right? So he pointed towards certain individuals. Those individuals you have nothing from. You've got, you've got statements and sayings of, from individuals who are anonymous, who can be deceivers, who can be liars, right? And, and I've just told you objectively that your Gospels are not true. Ignatius came much later. Your, uh, the, the, the part in Luke where he's talking about how I inherited this from previous generations all anonymous and you're relying upon them, upon them for your salvation for your salvation it makes no sense in the ears of any rational person in my opinion because we both believe in the infallibility of Christ okay and Christ pointed towards a certain individual you have nothing from that individual all you have from is, is anonymous individuals okay so okay from a historical secular perspective Christ was crucified, congratulations. From a historical secular perspective, Jesus wasn't born of a virgin. So what? They can say all they want. I'm talking from a religious basis here. We're, we're, we're people of faith. This is not a, you know, a, a debate within you know, a historical um, context solely, because then you'd have to be an atheist. You'd have to believe that Christ was uh, born from a, a, a virgin. All right. But let us see the clock at all times, if that's okay. Okay, I just want to read what the Quran actually says. It says that they rejected faith, that they uttered against Mary, a grave false charge. 
that he that they said in boast we killed Christ Jesus the son of Mary the messenger of Allah but they killed him not nor crucified him but so it was made to appear to them to those who differ therein are full of doubts with no certain knowledge but only conjecture to follow for the surety that they killed him not I want you to zoom in in your mind on these words but so it was made to appear to them now let's pull up the dictionary definition of a deceiver the dictionary definition of a deceiver is this one who misleads another or others by false appearance or statement especially one who does so habitually far from being a historian he was a deceiver who invents manipulates and modifies documents so one who misleads another by false appearance is the definition by the dictionary of a deceiver what does Allah say again in his holy book he says nor crucified him but so it was made to appear to them made to appear by who Allah how by making one person look by like another person to an audience of people who then go on to believe that person B is actually person A and that the X event occurred because of what they had done that is the dictionary definition of a liar and we have Allah bang to rights by both the definition of the word and by Allah's own testimony and by the Shia's testimony himself the fact that he didn't deceive Muslims doesn't mean that he didn't allow for seven centuries the deception of millions of people based on a testimony of people who saw an event that didn't happen but I want to come back to the fact that it was Christ crucified and why do I know this why do I know this because in the Gospel of John when you look at the resurrection appearances and you can't have a resurrection without a crucifixion in the resurrection appearances who is identified as the one resurrected Jesus Christ if we pretend for a minute that his Shia story is true there would be no resurrection there would be no resurrection appearances but yet the resurrection occurred people claimed to see a man alive that they had known was dead and they identified that man as Jesus Christ not as someone else and if it wasn't if there wasn't uh, if it wasn't Christ that they saw then that means it wasn't Christ crucified in which case there would be no resurrection appearances so I would like him to address the fact that we have so far three independent strands of evidence that all argue for the crucifixion of Jesus thank you very much right so the first point that I wish to address was the deceiver point that uh, Bob my instructor made and I'll just pull out the definition here it says deliberately cause someone to believe something that is not true especially for personal gain right the definition does not include and by the way leave a, an, an entire key to discovering the truth he, you, I mean you keep on doing this over and over again I told you Saint Peter knew the truth the true followers of Jesus knew the truth it doesn't matter that if anonymous individuals or hypocrites during the time of Jesus told lies that does not matter to me okay I'm telling you that, that the, the, the the key to knowing the truth right was within the successor of Jesus whom he points towards so he's not a deceiver if he's leaving the key to truth it literally says delivery calls someone to to, um, to believe something that is not true especially for personal gain you're not going to do that and, and, and then leave um, the method of actually discovering the truth now this idea of millions of people believing that Jesus died for their sins and so on it's not a problem for me because in the Quran it says which means that we will not 
punish someone and so we, we, we bring clear-cut evidence to them. Which means that those people who died upon ignorance and that belief will be tested in the Day of Judgment and, and then the truth will be clarified to them. It's not a problem for us at all, right? You're the one who has a problem with, you know, uh, previous generations not believing in the Trinity. That's why you made up the harrowing of hell where Jesus went and dug, you know, into the hellfire. Oh, Abraham, you didn't believe in the Trinity. Saved. So Abraham was in the hellfire all that time when Jesus, you know, when the Trinity wasn't clarified to the Old, uh, to, to the old Testament, which is, you know, a, a teaching that's no longer, that's no longer, that teaching is no longer accepted in the church, the harrowing of hell. But it was made because it was a huge problem. The earlier generations didn't believe in, in the Trinity, right? So it's not a problem for us because we have that concept in Islam, which means that if someone was deceived and they were ignorant and they, and, and they could not possibly reach the truth, then they will be tested in the Day of Judgment. We believe in multiple worlds. The, 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 this world is not just the end or be all, right? So that's your first thing. By the way, you actually think that those are all uh, different points, the four points you've quoted. Uh, the, the thing you quoted from John is actually the same as the second point. So the fourth and, the sec and second point is, is identical, right? Because John, uh, you know, you're going back to the Gospels and quoting from them. And we just told you that the Gospels have additions. So how can we not know that that part you're quoting from John is not an addition? It literally says in, in, your own, in, in its own book that the parts where Jesus goes and, um, and, and says that may, may ever, may ever who, is, who is not sinned cast the first stone, uh, you know, to, stone the, the, the adulteress is not in the old uh, scripture. So how can, I, how can I not be sure that your early church fathers or, or your early writers didn't do the same thing and, and, and corrupted your book, right? So you can't quote these four points and then play around like they're, they're different points. They're essentially similar points because we start with the, with the first point, which is, which is in the Gospel of Luke that mentions that, um, that earlier generations transmitted this information to us, right? So the, those were the initial liars. The Gospels were written by anonymous individuals. A church father in the second century says something. Congratulations, you can run with that if you want, but he's, he's not an authority upon any rational you know, th theological basis. And then your, your fourth point is the Gospel of John. It says that there was a re resurrection. Again, by an anonymous writer, and we don't have any evidence for this writer being uh, you know, attested to by Christ himself. I'm a follower of Christ. Show me objectively that Christ did die on the cross, theologically. From a historical basis, we don't, agree, we don't disagree, right? Secular historians will tell you that Christ was crucified. I, I, I do contest that. Secular historians will also tell you that Jesus wasn't born of a virgin, of a virgin which, we do, which we both we reject, right? We both believe that Jesus was born of a virgin. So this is a theological discussion in essence, not just a purely historical one. Okay. Thank you. You ready? So let's just talk about the Gospel of Mark. The Gospel of Mark, according to the tradition of the church, is the teachings of Peter. He said, show me Peter's teaching, I point to the Gospel of Mark. I also point to Peter, first epistle, and Peter, second epistle. I do not agree with secular um, scholars who say that Peter didn't write Peter. I believe Peter wrote Peter, and if you want to prove that Peter didn't write Peter, I would like to hear your evidence. Now, the fact of the matter is, when it comes to arguing this debate which we're having, which is about whether Christ was crucified, we're talking about a historical question. But that historical question is important. And why is it important? Because we have a clear marker in the road in which Islam goes one way and Christianity goes the other. An objective test about which of our religions is speaking the truth. If the Quran is wrong about Christ's crucifixion, what else is it wrong about? We've already established beyond any measure of doubt that the so-called source of the Quran, Allah, was a liar. And if he was a liar, he can't be trusted. Because if he lied about, if he lied in the first century, how do you know he wasn't lying in the seventh century? But here you have, here you have a statement, here you have a statement that we can measure truth by. Now, I want to bring in a fourth layer of evidence to Christ's crucifixion. And that is the account of others, non-Christians, including non-Jews, pagans, that talk about Christ's life. Let me read one, Tacitus. 
who was writing between 56 and 120 AD, and he wrote this. Consequently, to get rid of the report, Nero fastened the guilt and inflicted the most exquisite tortures on a class hated for their abominations, called Christians, by the populace. Christus, Christ, from whom the name had its origin, suffered the extreme penalty. The extreme penalty that was given during the reign of Tiberius was crucifixion. So we have a non-Christian, non-Jewish, pagan testifying to the fact that Christ was crucified. If Christ is crucified, Islam is false. Why? Because Islam says Christ was not crucified. He says these people were not witnesses. Well, I'm still waiting for him to name me one Muslim witness from the first century who witnesses that Christ was not crucified. Who was he? Who was that witness? Where can we see him? All we have are 7th century and later claims made by Muslims projected back 7 centuries without any basis in history. But yet, here we have what history says. History says, quoting Phlegon, but who was writing between 80 and 140 AD, Phlegon records that in the time of Tiberius Caesar at the full moon, there was a full eclipse of the sun from the 6th to the 9th hour. Phlegon also mentions, mentioned by origin. Now Phlegon in the 13th or 14th book, ah, I'll have to read it next to you. Well, before you start, yeah, Allah, you couldn't have been on the sheet. Allah, you don't want, bro, man. You don't want. What's your name, Sammy? What's the one? What's the one? All right. So, Tacitus. Tacitus was, as my own interlocutor that concedes, writing in the year 50s, right? 50s to the 100s, right? So he wasn't an eyewitness. Which is a problem, you know, this problem keeps on happening over and over again where we're quoting things that doesn't really help us. It helps within the secular, you know, um, when we're studying the religion of like, um, the history of religion. This evidence that he's presenting is very, very good evidence in, in that context. But in a theological context, where we're discussing regarding individuals who basically um, have a certain image regarding Christ, who revere him, who call him an infallible, this is, not, this is not enough for me. Tacitus is not an authority. Jesus did not make him an authority. So quoting him doesn't help you. Qu quoting the other guy, what was his name? Uh, Fe, what was it? What was the other guy's name that you quoted? Phlegon. Phlegon. He was also after Jesus, right? We, we, we both agree on that. But in a secular um, context, those quotations would be very, very good evidence to support uh, a historical conclusion that, that Christ was crucified. But in a theological context, what we're discussing Christ as a, as a figure who must be followed, as a messiah, as a prophet. You also believe that he's a prophet, by the way. It's, it's also in, in your books, right? But when we have this, in a sense, halo around this personality, it's not just any normal human being. We need substantial evidence, objectively, to prove to us that those individuals who are narrating that X, Y, Z happened, that they are an actual authority within, uh, within the teachings of Christ, right? Which is, which is something that I have not personally um, you know, seen from, from your uh, claims. Now, when it comes to uh, you saying that the church says that the Gospel of Mark is actually just taken from St. Peter, does the author himself claim that I took from Peter and that Peter himself said that you are an authority upon what I've written? So, so, so does St. So does Peter say, Oh Mark, you the author, I give you an authority to write upon X, Y, Z. Is that just something which the church later on said? Right? Because anyone can make claims, oh, the church claims that the, the Gospel of Mark is in reality uh, what St. What Peter told him. You'd have to substantiate that. You can't just say the church said. You have to show me how, how that makes sense, right? In terms of why I, I don't accept the letters and why uh, biblical scholars also don't accept the letters of uh, St. Paul as being from Paul, uh, uh, no, sorry, not Paul, uh, Simon Peter, why those epistles are not his, is because in the book of Acts, it actually mentions that the guy was uh, illiterate. He could not read and write, right? 
and there's a huge dispute what was it written in Hebrew was it written in Greek what was it written in so there's a lot of dark you know unknown uh, realities behind the history of those epistles when were the earliest manuscripts we have those, those epistles because you're not you're, you're not a, a religion which is which is primarily based on oral transmission it's true you do have oral transmission as you quote from the Gospel of Luke those were the traditions that were passed to us orally right it wasn't written down it was passed orally so you do have an oral transmission but your methodology of transmitting those narrations those epistles those writings was done purely on writing when was the, when were the earliest manuscripts they came way later than uh, than Saint, Saint Peter right and again the majority of biblical scholars rely on Acts when, when it mentions that he was a, a poor fisherman who couldn't read and write so it was very unlikely for him to write something that, as sophisticated as that, right? Especially learning multiple languages. So that's their reasoning, right? And obviously you have to substantiate because, by the way, if those writings, if those writings are indeed from, from St. Peter, that to me would be equivalent to the Quran, by the way, because St. Peter to me is infallible, okay? He's, he's, a, he's a successor of Christ. So whatever St. Peter says, I obey and I follow. Okay, so, so this, is, this would be very important for me. But you you have to prove it to me. You can't just say, "Well, I I reject scholarly opinion," right? You you actually have to prove that point, right? Okay. Very kind to be the microphone man. I appreciate it. Okay, we're ready. So he said, objective, substantial proof. I talked about the kerygma. I talked about a first-century series of documents that were written at the time in the place by people that the church knew to be witnesses and their companions. I showed that it was the established opinion of the early church in early church writings and I have also demonstrated and will again the fact that it was even accepted by non-Christians that Christ was crucified. In a debate that Origen was having against Celsus just like me and him are doing now we're quoting sources to back up our arguments. Origen quotes Phlegon in his argument against Celsus and says this. This is what Phlegon wrote. This is what Phlegon wrote. I just want to make sure it was Phlegon. Yep. Phle oh, fly me. One second. This is what Phlegon wrote. Jesus, while alive, was of no assistance to himself, but that he arose after death and exhibited the marks of his punishment and showed how his hands had been pierced by nails. So Phlegon is quoting, is, is, is basically agreeing with the story of the apostles. It is the accepted history of the time. He says, well, what authority do these people have? Well, a lot more authority than some 7th, 8th or 9th century Muslim to talk about what happened centuries earlier. He's still not provided any Muslim witness from the 1st century. All he's done is quote authorities from the 7th, 8th and 9th century to argue that Christ wasn't crucified, it was someone else. So I'd ask him to live by his own standards. Who are your first century Muslim witnesses? Where is the evidence that they existed? I'm not interested in your 7th century, 8th century, 9th century teachings that come centuries late in a region that had nothing to do with it and long after the events occurred. When I have an early kerygma that predates the New Testament, a New Testament document that was written before 70 AD, the writings of other non-Christian Jewish historians writing in the first century like Tacitus and Phlegon who talk about Christ being crucified, as well as the writings of the early church fathers that also testify to the historical event of Christ being crucified. The evidence is overwhelming and that is why he admits that historically Christ was crucified. Never. What are the theological implications of this? The theological implications to this is that Islam is false because the Quran states that Christ wasn't crucified which contradicts all of the actual evidence that we have. All of the evidence contradicts the Quran. It is literally a, one, a couple of lines from the Quran 
versus every other ounce of evidence that we can muster to answer this question. The reality is an objective person would go where the evidence leads them. And what we're looking for when we're looking for evidence about historical questions are early witnesses, variable witnesses, witnesses coming at it from different positions, and that is exactly what we have, including Paul, who started as an enemy to Christ, but accepted that Christ was crucified. Now, I'm, I'm just going to start where you finished. Um, Paul started as an enemy of Christ and then he submitted to Christ. We have in Shia Islam, this is absolutely not problematic. You know, because the Christians, they, 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 they always want to use this argument that Paul, he actually got beheaded. You know, he was, he was, you know, he got persecuted because of his beliefs. So, you know, what's your, why are you, why are you doubting his sincerity? Or we had individuals like Umar ibn al-Khattab, for example, the so-called second caliph, who I reject as a Shia Muslim, right? As a hypocrite and as an enemy of Islam. At the beginning, he was also an enemy. And then later on, he, pro he proclaimed to be what? Um, a follower of the Prophet and he, and, and he got worldly gains from this, right? So getting worldly gains from, from a, a true teaching because we believe in essence the, the message of Christ is true and whomever follows the truth will no doubt get rewards for this even in, the, in this world, not, in, not in, in the hereafter, right? So just saying that, oh, Paul was a, an, an enemy, okay, so what? There are lots of people who are enemies of the Prophet and who a accepted his message uh, outwardly despite being hypocrites. Right? So there's not a problem for me, uh, Paul being an enemy and the later on he accepted. The point being is that, Islamically speaking, uh, we use like some kind of uh, a, 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 a um, sequence-like kind of argumentation. First we have to prove that Islam is the truth, then, wh then whatever is within the scripture in Islam is, is therefore also by default the truth. By the way, there are also uh, sources pre uh, which predate Islam that uh, mention that Jesus was not cru crucified. The, not the, uh, in, in Egypt, they found those uh, ancient uh, Gnostic texts that mention, you know, from, from the letters of James or the Gospel of James or something like this, that mention that James, the stepbrother of Jesus, uh, mentions that uh, Jesus was not crucified actually. So there are, there are texts prior to Islam that do affirm that Jesus was not crucified. This, this, Muhammad wasn't the first to claim that Jesus wasn't crucified, right? This, 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 this did occur earlier. And the funny thing is when you quote uh, Origen, uh, who, who quotes this random, uh, you know, non-Christian, non-Jew historian who says that Jesus was crucified and he rose. Again, his, his interlocutor, the, the interlocutor of origin, should, should, say, should, should say to him, why is this individual an authority? Right? <laughs> because we shouldn't just accept individuals who say things. Uh, we need to objectively prove that those individuals actually did re receive revelation, or that they were truthful in their statements. Right? So this is the problem. Now, um, Bob says, can you bring me an, indivi an individual from the first century who attests that Jesus wasn't crucified. Well, Allah, because Allah is the all-seeing, the omniscient. I, I know, I know, this is going to sound a bit dodgy here and there, but Allah is the all-knowing, all-seeing. If we prove that God revealed the Quran to Muhammad through objective uh, proofs, then obviously we can interpolate that everything within that book is the truth, right? That's that, that's a rational way of looking at things. Um, but the idea that Islam was the first religion to come up with. Christ being crucified, that's not true. Gnostics were persecuted by Christians, by the way. They were killed and persecuted. Their, their scripture was burnt and they were killed, right, for their beliefs. Um, and the only Gnostic uh, offshoot that exists today is the, uh, are the uh, Mandeans in Syria and Iraq, I believe. All the other places, they're just completely wiped off. In Egypt, they found, you know, this old manuscript that shows uh, that, you know, that what Jesus says, it's attributed to him. Obviously, I can't affirm that Jesus said this, but it's attributed that Jesus said, I was not crucified, right? So, it's not a... It's not a, you know, and, and unfortunately it has not been carbon dated. The only thing that they've, they've done is that they've, they've realized that it's between the 4th and 5th century. Which is um, obviously way later than Jesus, I do concede to that. But, but the point being is, I would, I would, I would very much like, like them to carbon date it. So if anyone's out there listening, <laughs> carbon date those uh, works piece because it would be very interesting to see uh, how old they really are, uh, th those texts. So yeah, um, I would just say that from a theological perspective, uh, I, don't, I haven't seen um, evidence for Jesus being crucified because we have anonymous individuals narrating anonymous things uh, sorry anonymous individuals saying things and people of, of no authority stating things which to me means nothing brilliant okay thank you uh, so let, let's just go over this he's saying that we have anonymous people stating stuff what relevance does that have to the fact that they've got a testimony 
and that it predates everything that Islam has. Let's just allow the fact that he knows who said what within Shia Islam. Doesn't mean that it's true. In fact, it's objectively false. Every Muslim, even if you know when they were born, where they were born and what they had for tea every day, is objectively wrong when they say that Christ wasn't crucified. Why? Because they weren't witnesses. They were not there. That's his logic, remember? They didn't see it. That's his logic, remember? But the fact of the matter is that when you've got the charisma of the church that predates the New Testament, the New Testament itself, the writings of the early church fathers, and Jewish and pagan writers from the classical period all saying Christ was crucified, then you can call it a slam dunk that Christ was crucified. I'll give you one. Lucian of Samosata, right in between 115 and 200 AD. He was a Greek satirist, mocking Christianity, attacking Christianity, and he said this, the Christians, you know, worship a man to this day. This distinguished personage who introduced their novel rights and was crucified on that account. So the enemies of Christianity are witnessing to the fact that Christ was crucified. It wasn't just the claims of the Christians, it was the claims of the non-Christian haters as well. The Christophobes were saying Christ was crucified. The Christians were saying Christ was crucified. The Jews were saying Christ was crucified. How much more evidence do you need before you accept that Christ was crucified? And that cross breaks Islam. You know, Muslims believe that Christ will come and destroy the cross. On the contrary, it is the cross of Christ that destroys Islam because Islam is proven false by the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. And let's be clear, the identity of the crucifixion, of the person crucified, is guaranteed by the resurrection. The resurrection accounts identify Jesus Christ as the one risen from the dead. Remember, if Jesus Christ wasn't crucified, there was no resurrection so why did belief in the resurrection occur in the first place? Why not like so many other Jewish sects who believed in a Messiah, when their Messiah gets killed, they just go on to find another Messiah? I mean, there was plenty around at the time of Jesus. He wasn't the only one. But the fact of the matter is, rather than do what every other Jew has done when they have believed in a Messiah and that Messiah has died, and just said he's a great teacher, let's look for the real Messiah, these Jews believed that their Messiah had risen from the dead. Why? Because the prophets taught a suffering servant who would rise on the third day. That would, and he said the sign of Jonah to show that because Jonah was dead in the tomb. It's not about the time, it's about the state. Jonah was dead, Christ was dead. Jonah was brought back to life, Christ was resurrected. Ladies and gentlemen, this matters because if Islam objectively teaches something that is proven false, Islam is false and therefore you shouldn't build on it. Um, I just want to support uh, the claim made by my interlocutor, which is that Islam and Christianity cannot both be true. Why? Because we have a totally contradicting claim. Islam says Jesus was not crucified, but uh, the, um, Islam says Christ was not crucified and Christianity affirms this, which is 100% correct. Therefore, they cannot both be true. So we agree on that 100%. But, but the point being is that when my interlocutor also mentions a source from the second century, right? This guy who was mocking Christians. Look, people can mention all sorts of things. I mean, I can bring you thousands of historians today that will affirm this. They came much later. Gnostics are, by, by the way, first century Christians also. They were, they were, in, they were from the first century and they did not believe in the crucifixion of Christ. So there were, there were beliefs within the Christian branches and offshoots of Christianity from the very, very beginning that denied the crucifixion of Christ. So it's not a, an early kind of thing that appeared out of the blue. Gnostics are very early Christians. They denied the crucifixion of Christ, right? And they were persecuted, by the way, heavily by Christians, the Trinitarians.
Um, now, Bob also mentions that, you know, the Gospels mention the resurrection. The Gospels also mention a zombie apocalypse. What? Zombie apocalypse? Yeah. Matthew chapter 27, verse 52, and the tombs broke open. The bodies of many holy people who had died were raised to life. Do we believe in that? <laughs> Go to any secular historian, they will tell you that's a joke, right? They will not believe in that. If you want to use secular um, historical logic, you're going to burn both of us. We're going to perish, okay? Why? Because we, we now have to reject a lot of things. A lot of miracles have to be rejected. A lot of, um, you know, the virgin birth has to be rejected. The zombie apocalypse from, from Matthew that I just quoted has to be rejected. Because all of this is ahistorical. Because they, look, we have no concrete things. They just met the, the, the logic within, those, within the frameworks of, of uh, the history of religion is that what is the most logical, simple explanation? They use Occam's razor to deduce things. They use uh, things like what do, mo what, what do the majority of sources mention? They use um, you know, things like um, you know, proof from embarrassment. So if something really doesn't you know, make sense within the, 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 the logic of that religion, it's most likely true because they wouldn't author something that would go against them. So crucifixion of Christ is very unlikely for someone to, to author because you know, that's really terrible for Christians because the idea is Christ, he's the savior and he's the king, he's gonna rule. Put on the cross, what? Doesn't make any sense. So most likely, I mean, that's the logic that they use to do things. I don't, I don't disagree with that and I've followed it. But the point being is the theologically, that, that, that does not add up, right? It, it doesn't add up because you have to prove to me theologically on, on an authoritative basis, on an, on an authoritative basis that those individuals can you stop the time piece? Can you stop the time piece? Can you stop the time piece? Yeah, stop the time. Stop the time. We're, we're in the middle of a debate, bro. No, no, but I'm going to interject, yeah? Well, why are you interjecting? This has got nothing to do with you. What were you talking about? You, 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 you're, just coming, you're just coming accusing me of nothing. Go and correct your uncle. I'm afraid our debate might be interrupted because I suspect that this guy's going to start a fight with that guy. Right. Do you want to press on for a bit? Yeah, give him, carry on. Yeah, give him. Yeah, ready, press start and let him finish. Go on. So as, so, as we've mentioned, the resurrection, thank you very much. The resurrection, um, there's also a resurrection of, 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 you know, prophets from the Old Testament, as I've quoted from Matthew, right? I, I've got here. Thank you. Um, so, in Matthew, we also see a resurrection of, of Old Testament prophets. By the way, the only gospel that mentions the zombie apocalypse is uh, Matthew. All other gospels fail to mention that tombs broke up and people just rose from the dead. So, this idea of, of them affirming that Jesus rose from the dead, so what? I mean, the Gospel of Matthew affirms that Old Testament prophets rose from the dead. The other Gospels magically forgot to add that huge important event, which is, you know, very unlikely. So there's a lot of inconsistencies in, uh, in the actual Gospels, which, which makes it very problematic, right? So Islamically, when we want to prove something, we have to prove that this infallible gave, some, gave X person an authority, and I've yet to see that. Okay. So I, I want to I want to just start where the brother finished. I just want to start where the brother finished, which is this idea that one account misses out a detail that another count has. I'll just point out to him again. If you do, and I have done this, so I know it's true. If you write down the story of Adam and Eve, Iblis and Allah in each part of the Quran and you write them down next to one another synoptically what you see is that they have different accounts they don't match different words are used different speeches given different details given so if you're going to say we should reject the Gospels because of different details then be consistent because you should reject the Quran for that same reason you're saying that we don't have a witness to Christ's crucifixion. I'm sorry, where's your Islamic first century witness? I'm still waiting. Be consistent. You're not consistent. What you're doing is putting up a known liar, Allah, who you admit lied and deceived people against all the weight of history. And I simply say to you that going back to the beginning of our argument, 
The father of lies is the devil. When Peter said, be it not unto you, Lord, when he, Christ said he was going to be crucified, Christ rebuked Peter and said, get ye behind me, Satan. The teachings of Islam are satanic in origin. The demon that spoke to Muhammad lied because it is a demon. I don't deny the spiritual experience. I accept Muhammad had a spiritual experience. He was lied to by the devil. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I want to point out that the opinion of scholars is unanimous. Christ was crucified. And I'm going to quote Muslim's favorite scholar, Dr. Bar Ehrman. This is what Dr. Bar Ehrman says that Jesus' followers and later Paul had resurrection experiences is, in my judgment, a fact. What the reality was that gave rise to those experiences, I do not know. Paul's tradition that 500 people saw Jesus at the same time has led some people to suggest that Jesus' followers suffered from mass hysteria. But mass hysteria does not explain the other traditions, Bart Ehrman says. Finally, we know that after his death, his followers experienced what they described as the resurrection, the appearance of a living but transformed person who had actually died. They believed this, they lived it, and they died for it. That is Dr. Bart Ehrman speaking about the evidence of Christ's crucifixion and resurrection. In other words, your favorite scholar Muslims agrees with us. The history agrees with us. The Gospels agrees with us. The church teaching agrees with us. The writings of pagans and Roman historians and Jewish writers and even critics and enemies of the Christian faith agrees with us, Christ was crucified. And if Christ was crucified, that means objectively Islam is false. Because if you're saying X didn't happen, but all the evidence of history says X did happen, then that means you're wrong. The reality is, ladies and gentlemen, we have a clear forking in the road upon a historical question that about Christ's crucifixion that demonstrates Islam to be false and affirms the Christian tradition. Right, so you came up with a list of, of you know, groups and individuals who do attest to the crucifixion of Christ. However, you, just, you, you completely ignore the Gnostics, who are first century Christians. You completely ignored them, and they are, it's historically proven they're first century Christians. You completely ignored the Gnostics, and you went and said, oh, the, the Gospel says, and the pagans have said, and secular historians have said, but what about Gnostics, though? They contradict you completely. They don't believe in the crucifixion of Christ, right? And as I've mentioned, when, when we want to look at the Islamic claim, um, it's not just about the claim being in the Quran. We have to, it's, it's more of, a, it's more of a, a, a sequential claim. So you have to prove that Islam is correct, then the claims uh, which, which are from the unseen. This idea that, for example, believe in the angels, or believe that Christ wasn't crucified, or, or things like that. They believe in the unseen. We can then interpolate that those are also facts and, and true and, and truth, right? But the thing is, if, if you want to rely upon secular uh, historical um, you know, understandings, then, then you yourself will perish as well. Because your entire belief system about Jesus doing miracles and all that will also go, will also go in the waters, right? So let's, let's, let's basically keep it within theology. Theologically, we, we, we believe that Christ is a head figure that must be followed. Can you, and, and I've yet to repeat it, can you prove to me theologically that Jesus gave authority to those individuals to, to talk about him, to basically narrate from him? You can't do that, right? So, from, so I mean, congratulations from a secular historical uh, you know, framework. Okay, they, they concede, as you, quote, as you quoted, Dr. Bart Ehrman. And he's not my, I don't take my theology from Bart Ehrman, right? Because if you're consistent and took your theology, your theology from Bart, Bart Ehrman, you would reject him being God. You'd have to reject him being born of a virgin. You have to reject him doing miracles and all that. But you're not consistent, right? You pick and choose. I am very consistent in terms of me discussing a theological reality. 
the, the theological concept of Christ, which has, which has to include history, because we're discuss, this, discussing a historical personality, but we have to look at, at the person of Christ from a, historical, from a theological lens, not purely from a secular historical angle. Right? Because if we do that, we will both perish, as I've mentioned. Because if you're consistent with your secular uh, um, opinions regarding, um, regarding uh, Christ, then, he's, then he, and you can no longer worship him, you can no longer call him Christ, you can no longer um, see him as a, as a holy person, right? Because all of that is completely rejected within the, uh, within the uh, theological framework. Now if, now, if you go to theology, you're also condemned. Why? Because those individuals whom you rely upon, Jesus did not tell us to rely upon them, right? Which is, again, you, you, you basically uh, are going to fall in that hole where when you, when you go back to those personalities, and they themselves, for example, attest to Christ um, dying on the cross. They're anonymous. Did, did, did Christ say, Matthew, write a gospel and, and, uh, and you're my uh, trustworthy individual, right? The, the Prophet, for example, would say to Ali, um, umni alayk. Write that which, which I tell you, uh, which basically um, um, comes from my mouth. An individual by, by the name of um, Abdullah, the son of uh, Amr ibn al-As, who was a companion of the Prophet, would write things down. And he was attested to by the Prophet. So individuals who lived during the time of the Prophet were attested to by him personally. Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Jesus did not say you are an authority to basically write things down. Those individuals who orally transmit that Jesus was crucified are anonymous. Uh, pagans who, who basically say things all came after that incident. So none of it makes sense, none of it adds <laughs> up. right? So when you rely upon secularists, you condemn yourself. If, if you rely upon your Bible, you condemn yourself. Okay, shall we do a final round? Oh, uh, yeah? Do you want to stop it after this, this go? Yeah, we can do that. All right. So, let me just deal with the Gnostic thing. Firstly, the Gnostics don't deny that Christ was crucified. What they deny is that Christ had a real humanity that was crucified. In other words, they say the crucifixion was an illusion. Why do the Gnostics say that it is an illusion? Because they say Christ is God and God can't have a material body because the material body is bad and therefore Christ wasn't crucified. He only appeared to be crucified. So in other words, what we're seeing is that even the Islamic idea of the non-crucifixion being illusory is something that has its origins in other non-Christian groups and non-Islamic groups. Furthermore, all the Gnostic literature is too late. All of it, too late. You're putting up a second and third century document against something that is first century. I have first century New Testament. You're appealing to second and third century Gnostic literature. Case closed. Secondly, at no point has he provided a Muslim first century witness at all. I'll just leave Muslims with this thought. The Quran says that Allah said to the followers of Jesus that I will make you the uppermost, the superior, the victors over against your enemies. That is a first century promise of Allah to the supposed Muslim followers of Jesus. Which means that, according to the Quran, the early first century Muslim community should have won out against Pauline Christianity. But what is the testimony of history? We Trinitarians won. We Pauline Christians won. That means that Allah failed in his promise. He made a promise in the first century to make Muslims the uttermost over their enemies and then he failed to deliver. Why? Because as we've already established, he was a liar. Why? Because that claim was never real. Every single thing that my interlocutor has argued is based on 7th, 8th and 9th century arguments of Muslims. They have no connection to history. I have laid out the following evidence. An early oral tradition that predates the New Testament. For a first century collection of documents called the New Testament. The writings of the early church fathers and the writings of 
Christians and critics of Christianity coming from Jewish, Roman pagan and obviously Christian authors, all of which testify to the fact that Jesus Christ was crucified. If Jesus Christ was crucified, then we have an objective, measurable claim that we can test that will either prove or disprove Christianity or Islam. The weight of evidence is firmly on the side of the Christian and that is why Dr. Bart Ehrman, no friend of the church, no friend of the Christian faith, acknowledges that the crucifixion, in his words, is one of the surest events of Jesus Christ's life. That's Dr. Bart Ehrman. That means that because Christ was crucified, Islam is false because the Quran says that Allah can't be wrong and Allah was wrong. Right. Uh, uh, Bob, you basically brought up a very important point, which is this idea of God promising to enable the followers of Christ to be superior upon the, uh, over, the, over the disbelievers. And he says, historically, the Trinitarians have actually been the ones who have been superior. That's 100% true, but you don't... Uh, there, there is an important, I mean, you, I'm, I'm pretty sure you basically don't know this, but it's a misunderstanding. There's an important theological concept in Shia Islam known as uh, al-raj'ah, ah, which means the return. So prior, to, um, prior to, the day, day, to the day of judgment, those who have the most faith will return and those who have the most disbelief will return. So during that time, there will be essentially a battle, a war between those individuals and the true believers will win. So it's, it's talking about that sense, that during the raj'ah, ah, the uh, all, all believers, followers of Christ, followers of Muhammad, who, all followers of the prophets, will be victorious and superior, right? So that's the verse, that's the context of the verse, uh, basically. Now, I'm going to quote um, an, an early Gnostic uh, teaching uh, in, 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 in Alexandria by uh, Basilides, who wrote in the year 120, and he basically taught that a bait and switch had occurred at, at the crucifixion, and it was Simon of uh, Cyrene. Right? So we have an early individual from the early 2nd century who, who, who is from the Gnostic school who teaches that there was a bait. Uh, and um, so that's basically just a point to mention. Now, uh, to, to, to discuss the points that, that Paul had mentioned, he says there was, an oral, there was an early oral teaching as mentioned in the Gospel of Luke. Uh, I've, I've critiqued that as being basically hearsay. I mean, we have, we have no idea of, uh, of who those individuals are, so it's just hearsay. Then he mentions that we had, uh, you know, early Jewish gospel writers. Sure, they were Jews, they were early gospel writers. But do they have a theological uh, authority? I am a follower of Christ, so in a sense you can even call me Christian. But obviously I'm not going to take that name because I'm not a Trinitarian, people will think that. I'm a Muslim, right? I, I, submit, I, I submit my words to Allah, uh, but I'm also a follower of Christ. So I need to see theological implications that the authors, uh, Mark, Matthew, um, and uh, Luke and John had an authority to write those things on Jesus' behalf. You failed to show that. Then you mention um, that you had you know, pagan individuals writing. They all came after that incident. So they are relying on that heresy. They're relying on those uh, things that were spreading around, right? Then there's, then there's the issue of God being a deceiver, right? Which you also have repeated and repeated. I mentioned that we had an authentic tradition from Jesus himself in, in Shia Islam, um, in the uh, exegesis book of Ali ibn Ibrahim. His book to us Shia is like Sahih al-Bukhari to the Sunnis. All um, chain-based transmissions in that book are all authentic. He transmits from the, from the um, fifth infallible Imam, um, uh, Muhammad al-Baqir, that Jesus said. Now, when we say obviously there's, there's like centuries between Muhammad al-Baqir and Jesus, we say that obviously this infallible Imam has uh, connected to, to God, right? Which, which in, in, in a later discussion we can prove whether Islam is the truth or not, right? But he authentically transmits that Jesus said, uh, to his followers that, that you will split into three groups right after I, my, my departure two thirds which, mean, which means that the majority will be in hellfire because they are deceivers they are hypocrites one third those true followers of St. Peter my successor they will be in paradise right so if you had preserved the teachings of, of St. Peter you, you, you would not be in this predicament and, and, and as we've mentioned um, if someone who was ignorant for example or who was not convinced that, that Jesus uh, was not crucified they will be tested in the Day of Judgment as per the, the, the verse in the Quran وَمَا كُنَّا مُعَذِّبِينَ حَتَّى نَبْعَثَ رَسُولًا which means that we would not punish an, a group until we would uh, bring them a message and, and God also says وَمَا وَلَا تَزِرْ وَازِرَةٌ وِزْرَ أُخْرَى which means that a person cannot bear the sin of another person so if you've been misled, it's not your fault for being misled 
God will test you in a fair test at the day of judgment, and then uh, they will be decided whether you will basically attain paradise or perish. So that's basically uh, the end of it. And thank you very much for. It was a really discussion. lovely discussion yeah. again. It was. It was. Thank you so much. As always, I want to give you a gift. Thank you. Oh, I've, I've, I've actually read your book, and I'm going to give it back to you. Oh, okay, thank you very much. Uh, JP? Um, I'm, I'm actually going to go back to Denmark on the 23rd. Okay. And we've had two discussions on Christianity. Not why I want an Islam. Well, because I feel like a lot of it is on Christianity. I'm happy. I mean, the, the, the reason, one of the reasons why. So I don't really know Shia Islam as well as I know Sunni Islam. You can just ask me questions and I can answer it. And then your audience maybe can learn more about Shia Islam. Is yeah, yeah. What, what would be interesting is, is maybe I, I will look up some um, some literature and um, come to you with some questions. Sure. Um, but I, I want to I wanna give you this as a gift. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. can take that with you to Denmark. Yes. Keep in touch with me. And um, you've got my, my email is on, on my own channel, not Soko Films. So I've got a channel which is different from Soko Films. Mm. Soko Films is, is not my channel, it's JC's channel. So mine is Bob of Speakers Corner. And in all the description boxes, I put the email. You can get in touch with me that way. Just bear in mind that I've got yeah. over a thousand emails. So if I don't answer straight away, I will eventually answer, but it might be months after you write yeah, your original fine, email. Yeah. So it'll be a slow correspondence, but yeah. a happy one. Yeah. Okie dokie, yeah. thank you so much. You much. Yeah, God yeah, bless yeah. you, you look after yourself. Have a lovely day. So I just want to do a wrap up. And I want to, I want to address something which Muslims don't get, don't understand and don't engage with, which is that the church has said that these are the Gospels that we follow. And it's the church that has invested that authority in them. Those Gospels are what we believe in. It is not required for us to show you a verse where Jesus says, follow the writings of Mark, Matthew, Luke or John. Christ gave his apostles and the apostles founded the church and that church embraces the Gospels. The reality is, guys, that on this one, it's a slam dunk for the Christian faith. Muslims have no argument. As you could see, at one point in the debate, he was trying to change the topic. And he admitted repeatedly that the evidence is overwhelming Christ was crucified. And all of his arguments appeal, um, fail when you apply the double standard test. Because we have, what does he have? He has seventh, eighth and ninth century claims to appeal to. We have overwhelming evidence of Christ's crucifixion. And that means that we have a very clear disproof of Islam. And I simply invite you to follow the evidence. Right then, shall we stop? Cut.